Yo, what's going on YouTube and welcome back to Goal Line Hockey. It's your boy Kevin Forte and today we are taking a look at the latest rumors on the Chicago Blackhawks, Patrick Kane. So we've continued to get more information on what be what could be coming here down the pipeline heading into the NHL trade deadline for number 88 of the Blackhawks, but we're going to do some mock trades today. So obviously, before I get into today's video, make sure to leave those down below. Leave your mock trades in the comment section down below, and we'll take a look at that um, here over this week. So with mine, it's kind of interesting because we've heard a lot of interesting rumors about Patrick Kane here over the last several months, but a really interesting one we've heard recently was from David Pajnoda. He said that Patrick Kane has received serious interest from the Dallas Stars, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Edmonton Oilers, the Colorado Avalanche, and of course, both of the New York area teams. So it's kind of interesting as we're getting closer to the deadline, you know, here in the next three months, two, three months, um, you know, Patrick Kane will be probably traded by the time, um, the deadline is over. Now, another interesting thing we also heard was a little bit more about Jonathan Taze. But before we get into Taze, uh, another interesting thing here from Elliot Friedman. He said that the Bruins are targeting Patrick Kane ahead of the trade deadline. So another team to add into the mix of the teams I already mentioned. Now, apparently the Islanders had an interesting thing here. And this is from NHL Trade Rumors. They said that the New York Islanders are expected to go after some big names via the trade market and look for them to target one of Patrick Kane, Bo Horvat, or Timo Meyer. Um, so that's definitely interesting. And, you know, honestly, as an Islander fan, I don't really want to hear this. Um, I think the Islanders should maybe go the other direction. I think that right now... You know, they have some good fundamental prospects in the system. You've got a young Wallstrom. You've still got a young Bellow, you know, Bellows. A young Wallstrom, a young Ratu, a young Barzell. And the thing is, if the Islanders can kind of recruit here in the next one or two years, they can get back on track. But I think they need to reset this year. I think trying to go all in this year, picking up a rental at the deadline, I could only see bad things happening here, and especially Patrick Kane, who's 33 years old. I do have my genuine concerns about Kane in particular, and the other two make a little bit more sense in Bo Horvat and Timo Meyer. but again, if you're giving up draft assets and players in terms of capital, that's where I'm a little bit hesitant, and I'm like, all right, maybe that's not the best move here for the New York Islanders long term. So apparently... um. So apparently we heard a trade package. So the NHL insider takes a look at what the trade package will likely look like if and when Kane goes to the Rangers. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And again, the thing with the Rangers is they have a lot of younger players that they can throw in the deal. But what makes things more complicated is the value of some of those younger players because some of them have not performed necessarily well since they were drafted and really haven't developed in the New York Rangers organization that the way that I think people were hoping for. Now, in terms of mock trades here for Patrick Kane, we've got a couple that I came up with. Really two that I could really get anything legitimate. And of course, they're the Kings and the Rangers. So starting with the Rangers, we have the Chicago Blackhawks getting Capo Caco, a 2023 conditional first round pick, and defenseman Matt Robertson. Okay, so to break the deal down, um, apparently the rumors we've been hearing for some of these assets is it's probably going to cost you a first round pick, a really good forward prospect, and a really good defensive prospect. And... What's different about these guys is, you know, Kako is NHL ready. He's already been playing in the National Hockey League for two seasons now. So this isn't anything new for him. And by the end of this year, it'll be his third season already in the National Hockey League going into his entry-level contract. No, never mind. Wow, he's already played that long. Wow, how Tom flies. So I believe this is his fourth season in the National Hockey League. Yeah. So it's his fourth season with the New York Rangers, 
Um, I can't believe how quickly that's happened, but that's crazy. But so Capo Caco as a main point of that deal. But again, if you ask people around the league, well, Capo Caco's value is kind of not as concrete as you would think from a former second overall pick just a few years back in 2019. Now, if you look at the success he's had with the Rangers, um, it's been kind of to varying degrees. Uh, he had 23 points in 66 games that first season with the Rangers, but they weren't very good that year. Um, his second season, he picked up 17 points in 48 games. He picked up 18 points in 43 games. And this year, he is about to break his total, his record numbers in a season um, this year. He's already got 15 points. He's got nine goals, which is more than all of last year in a shortened 43-game schedule. But still, eight games ahead of that, he's already got two more goals. Um and the thing is, he's going to be playing his 200th game here in the next couple of weeks by the end of January. So, you know, Kako has, has got a decent amount of games under him. And the fact is, truthfully, he doesn't really have the numbers there. Like, he's got 73 points, which isn't bad. But it's, again, when you're talking about a second overall pick, you're maybe expecting a little bit more and a little bit sooner. And he is still 21 years old, but again... You're talking about, all right, what have you really shown for me here? And that's what I think part of the problem is with Kako. So some people might say, oh, he's got a ton of value, right? He's a second overall pick and this and that. And then others will tell you, well, he hasn't had a point a season yet where he's even eclipsed really any kind of impressive marks, right? 23 points, 17, 18, 15. He's never played a full 82-game schedule. How does he handle that? Like, there's so many factors here that I think is kind of hurting him in his development and the way he's perceived around the National Hockey League. The first-round pick is kind of interesting because the Rangers already have another first-round pick, and that was a part of the Nils Lundqvist trade a couple of months back. It's a conditional first-round pick, and basically the, the condition is the pick is a top-10 selection of the Stars, um, it becomes a un unprotected pick in 2024. Now, my condition on the Rangers pick of this year would be something to the effect of either one of the higher of the two, whether it's Dallas's pick or the Rangers pick, one, or two, if there's a long-term extension with the Rangers. So if it becomes a long-term extension with the Rangers, it becomes a first-round pick. If he ends up not signing with the Rangers, maybe that ends up becoming, say, a second or third round pick instead. And, you know, the thing with the Rangers is their draft picks are kind of weird here over the next couple of years. This year, they don't have their own third, fourth, or fifth round pick. And next year, they don't have their own third round pick. So it would either have to be a conditional pick that if he doesn't re-sign with the Rangers, it becomes a second round pick either this year or next, or a fourth round pick in 2024. So that's kind of what you're looking at here. And that's why I think there is a little bit of hesitancy to maybe where the Rangers end up going, because I think they want to see where they end up in the standings. I think they're going to be a team that waits a little bit more down to the wire to make a big move. Now, the really interesting piece of this whole trade with the Rangers is, of course, Robertson. And the reasoning I have for trading a guy like Matt Robertson is the fact he's been playing with the Hartford Wolfpack. And this is a guy that's a pretty highly regarded prospect. And that's where maybe some of that the value you kind of lose with Capo Caco, you're able to gain a little bit more with Matt Robertson. Now, it's not surprising that Robertson's not playing in the NHL. He's the same age as Capo Caco, but he was a 2019 second round pick of the Rangers. And he's played, he has not played in the NHL yet. Um, he's played three seasons in the WHL with the Edmonton Oil Kings and quite fitting based off of his frame. He's a, he's a big guy, 6'4". He's actually not that much weight, 202 and 6'4". So he's a big Western Canadian kid. Um, and then the last two years now, this is his second season in the American Hockey League with the Hartford Wolfpack. And, you know, really what you're looking at more there is, you know, is he disciplined? Is what's his plus minus look like? Cause 
In terms of points, it's nothing impressive. He's got 20 points over two seasons so far in Hartford. But again, you're looking at this guy more as a shut down defenseman that has a little bit of offensive mobility. And that's kind of what you're looking at with Matt Robertson. So the problem is the Rangers don't really have much room for him in the lineup. And at 21 years old, you should be saying this is a guy that maybe toward the second half of the year starts to get some action and some playing time. The only problem is with this Rangers blue line, there's nowhere for him to really play. Uh, Truba and Fox are here long term, so they're not going to get moved. <coughs> Excuse me. Ryan Lindgren, Keandre Miller, Braden Schneider, Libor Hayek, and Ben Harper is your defense. So the fact that guys like Libor Hayek and Braden Schneider and Miller and even Ben Harper on a lesser point are getting more ice time than him in the NHL, it does make you wonder what's going to happen there. Now, the, the caveat here is I think Hayek and Harper are there because instead of Robertson playing, say, third pairing minutes in the NHL or being scratched, they'd rather him play top line minutes or top two pairings in the American Hockey League. So I think it makes sense in that sense for his development to be playing more in the AHL than playing less or, if at all, potentially being scratched up with the New York Rangers. So it does make sense there. And I see a window here where we could see Matt Robertson maybe jump into the lineup here, if not this year, maybe even next year. Now, here's the thing. Depends on how loyal the Rangers are to Keandre Miller. The Rangers don't have a ton of cap space, but they have a huge issue here in the fact that Keandre Miller is due for his next contract. And the Rangers, money-wise, their cap space uh, is going to be projected to be $17 million next summer. And they do have the money to do that, except there's a couple of issues. Philip Hedl gets a raise. Sammy Blay probably will. Alexi Lafreniere comes off of his ELC. Vitaly Kravtsov, Julian Gauthier, um, and of course, Keandre Miller. They all come off the books. And the Rangers need a new backup, as Yara Halak is a one-year option. But again, we expect Dylan Garand to probably be in between the pipes behind Shesty next year for the Rangers. So when I look at that scenario, again, I think the Rangers, if it's not Matt Robertson, would the Rangers be willing to give up Keandre Miller? Because money-wise, it might get tight. And that's where maybe you have to decide, do you want Keandre Miller, who's the proven commodity on the back end, and we want to re-sign him, but it is going to cost a lot of money and take up a significant portion of cap space this summer? Or is that where they say, we're going to trade the young guy, Matt Robertson, He's not going to develop here. We've kept Keandre Miller long term. It doesn't make sense for us to keep Robertson because, truthfully, he's an NHL defenseman at this point. He spent a couple years in the AHL grinding it out. He's going to get a shot in the NHL. It's just not going to be with the Rangers. And I think that's something that you have to look at here. So in this trade, it could, depending on if the Rangers are willing to, it could be either Keandre Miller or Matt Robertson. And, of course, in exchange, the Rangers get Patrick Kane. So the LA Kings are the other team, and this one was kind of fun because the Kings, kind of like the Rangers, have a couple of different assets that could be of value. So the first thing is, of course, kind of like the Rangers, the LA Kings straight up get Patrick Kane. But in the return package, it's kind of interesting. So we have Gabe Velarde, a 2023 first round draft pick, and defenseman Tobias Bjornfoot. Now here's the problem. If the Rangers and the Kings end up being the only the two teams left at the table, I would say that the Blackhawks would take the Rangers' offer of either Matt Robinson or Keandre Miller over Tobias Bjornfoot. And the reason for that is I just don't know how good this kid actually is going to be. And the and the Kings have made it kind of clear that they don't want to trade a guy like Brent Clark. I don't see them doing anything crazy like that, or even trading a Mikey Anderson. I just don't think it makes sense. Um, really here for the Kings. Now, here is the thing. Mikey Anderson is due for a new contract this summer. So the Kings have the cap space. They have $15 million of cap space to work with. But that is something to consider here in the, the event that there is an issue in terms of money this year for them. You know, it's going to be a completely new goalie tandem. Quick, uh, Phoenix Copley, um, and, you know, Cal Peterson is here long term, but they're going to need a new backup behind Cal Peterson next year. 
Mikey Anderson needs a new deal. Um, Edler's deal ends. Gabe Velarde, Jarrett Anderson Dolan, and Brandon Lemieux. All their contracts expire for the rain, uh, for the Kings. So, you know Velarde and Anderson Dolan are going to see raises. So, the thing is, if you trade Velarde, well, now you don't have to worry about that money. You could bring up one of your young guys. And then, again, with, with Bjornfoot, again, there's some questions about what could happen there. Um, but I think, again, this is a Kings team that has a lot of assets to throw around. You know, I don't think they want to trade Quentin Byfield. So, again, that's what makes Gabe Velarde a little more expendable. Uh, you have Quentin Byfield, Alex Turcotte, Francesco Cagnelli, uh, Rasmus Kupari. You know, they aren't great prospects, but they're guys that can play. And I think that the you know the you know the Blackhawks have made it a point that they want more younger centers on this team, and you kind of saw that evident at the draft when they were picking up a couple of of pretty good players there. And you look at their back end; it's pretty stacked. You know, you looked at the Canadians, um, the Canadian World Junior roster. Three of the six defensemen were Blackhawks prospects, right? Kevin Korchinski, Del Maestro, and I'm trying to remember the other guy. Um, you know, they have some really good players there in Chicago on the back end. So even if they get a little bit lesser in terms of a Tobias Bjornfot, it's still a good gritty defenseman that can come in right away. And I think that's a value here for a team like the Blackhawks. So let me know what you guys think down below. What do you guys think of these mock trades? I really tried to do a deep dive into each team, why I thought each player would make sense. But of course, let me know what you guys think down below with some mock trades and if you agree or disagree with me on my mock trades. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you again next time.